Good morning. We welcome you here this morning for our Easter service. We are so glad that you are here to celebrate with us. Will you please stand and join us as we begin singing together?
for singing and you may be seated. Whether you are here in this room, this sanctuary, or whether you are joining us remotely this morning, we are glad you are here and welcome you to Easter Sunday morning at Pleasantdale Church. I pray that we might be alert to the movement of God's Spirit as we have gathered to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is indeed our King. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do praise you and give you thanks this morning for all you have done for us and continue, continue to do for us in and through the person of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. We are glad that we can gather today. You have brought everyone here for your purpose this morning. Fulfill that purpose in each of our hearts as we worship you. And it is in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning we're going to read um, a story, and we're going to actually weave it in through the service. So I'm just going to read a few pages at a time, and they will be up on the screen so you can follow along. It's called The Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross. A very long time ago, right here in this world, there was a garden. In the garden, everything was wonderful. The world was full of laughing and playing and smiling and fun. There was nothing bad, ever. There was no one sad, ever. And best of all, God was there. Hello, Adam. Hello, Eve. He made it all. He was in charge of it all. He loved it all. People could see God and speak to God and just enjoy being with God. Eve, God's here. He wants to talk with us again. How cool is that? Yeah, I bet it's going to be even more amazing than yesterday. It was wonderful to live with God. But then, one day, the people did a terrible thing. They decided they didn't want to do what God said. They decided they wanted a world without God in charge. God calls this sin. Sin spoils things. So sin has no place in God's wonderful garden. God said to the people, you can't live with me in the garden anymore. And he sent them outside. To show the people they had to stay outside, God put some warrior angels in front of the garden. The angels were like a big keep out sign. Now things were sometimes bad. And people were sometimes sad. But people still kept sinning because they didn't want God to be in charge. So no one could come into God's wonderful place. God said, because of your sin, you can't come in. This is how the story begins. With a divine garden who cultivates the foundations of the universe, and plants an exquisite garden. And then the author of life breathes his breath into humanity, to his image bearers. And then the author of love places them in that sacred garden, in his garden. That sacred garden is our true home. We belong in that sacred garden, a place where everything is wonderful, a place where there is nothing bad ever, where there is nothing sad ever, and best of all, God is there. The garden is a place of beauty and goodness and truth. It is a place where humanity can thrive in relationship with the author of love himself. But true love is never coercive. 
God will not force anyone to love him or choose him or follow him. And so this is the long, sad, unfolding history of humanity where we choose to love other things more than God to reflect our glory rather than His glory. We distort what is beautiful. We confuse what is good and we twist what is true. And so the guardians of the holy, these warrior angels, stand resolute at the entrance of the sacred space that we were made to inhabit. And we find ourselves far from God and far from home, unable to return. But this is not the end of the story. From the moment man first disobeyed the Father, we were then held captive by our sin. The law of God demanded a sacrifice, restoring to himself his own again. So the Lamb, His only Son, was freely offered, atonement for our sin forever made. He, innocent and holy, still God and God only, could ransom and redeem us back again. So to the cross they carried him with all our guilt and all our sin. The Lamb of God was slain for our transgressions. And on the cross those nail-pierced hands reached up to God and down to man. And just as if I'd never sinned, he took me in his arms. Embracing me, he willingly forgave. For mercy, grace, and love that knows no bounds. Though guilty and condemned, I now am free. Forever I'm forgiven. For Christ. 
God wanted people to remember, it is wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. So he told the people to build a special building called his temple where he would live. In the middle of the temple was the most wonderful place in the world, the place where God was with nothing bad and nothing sad. It was very exciting. But then God told people to put a big curtain around this wonderful place. The curtain had pictures of warrior angels on it. It was a big keep out sign. For hundreds of years, the temple curtain reminded people that God said it is wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. Babies became grown-ups and had babies, and those babies became grown-ups and had babies, and those babies became grown-ups and had babies. Hundreds of summers and winters passed by, and the keep-out curtain stayed in the garden. Sorry, in the temple. Here at Pleasantdale, we have spent several weeks talking about the theme of temples in Scripture. Now, the first temple that the Israelites built was actually a tent. It was called a tabernacle. It's called a tabernacle. And there's something fascinating about this tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, because it was a tent, it was portable. And it was a reminder to the Israelites as they traveled through the wilderness of God's presence with them. That the tabernacle was a place for God to dwell in the midst of his people. Now, Moses received all these instructions. God gave all these instructions to Moses for how to build the tabernacle. Very specific instructions, 12 chapters worth of instructions. But what's fascinating about those instructions is that they echo the language of creation in the beginning of our Bibles. They echo the creation language. And so the tabernacle, you see, it had this big courtyard. And inside of the courtyard was a sacred space. And inside that sacred space, was an ark, the ark of the covenant that served as a throne for God in the middle of that sacred space. And there, separating the sacred space from the courtyard out of it, was a curtain. A curtain marked with warrior angels. These guardians of the holy, those Guardians of humanity's sacred home. Now, the temple, you see, the tabernacle, it was a microcosm of Eden. An embassy of the sacred garden. And so as the Israelites carried the tabernacle with them, it was a reminder to them that though they were not home, they could carry home with them. And there in that sacred space, beneath the throne of God, were the tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Tablets that stood as a reminder of the relationship of God with his people and the promise that he would be their God and they would be their people. And so this stood as a reminder to the people that God's love is relentless and that God longs to be where his people are and that God would bring his people home. Now hundreds of summers and winters passed by and the tabernacle became a temple and that temple became another temple. And that temple became another temple. But through all the seasons, one thing remained the same. And that is that those guardians of the holy, they stand resolute at the entrance to the sacred space. The keep out sign stayed in the temple. But this church... It's not the end of the story. 
Then one day, God the Son came to live in this world as a person, and he was called Jesus. Jesus always did what God said. Jesus never sinned. And Jesus visited the temple where the keep-out curtain hung. Jesus knew that things were sometimes bad and sometimes sad. Jesus said that God had sent him to open the way back to God's wonderful place, where there would be nothing bad and no one sad. But people still didn't want to let God be in charge. So they decided to put Jesus on a cross to die. It was the most bad thing that had ever happened. It was the most sad day of all. But Jesus had a plan. He always planned, he had always planned to die on the cross. What a strange plan. Why would God's son plan to die? A reading from God's word in the gospel of Luke, starting in chapter 23, verses 33 through 46. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice about him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. We invite you once again to stand and join us as we sing together.
On the cross, Jesus took our sin. All the bad things we do and all the sad things they cause, Jesus took them all from us. And when he did, something amazing, astonishing, astounding happened. The curtain tore. God ripped up the keep out sign. God's wonderful place is open again. Because Jesus died, we can go in.
After Jesus died, his friends put him in a tomb. They were very sad. For two days, nothing happened. Then, the next morning, Jesus' friends went to see his body in the tomb, and it wasn't there. A little later, Jesus' friends were all together, and suddenly, Jesus was there, alive. Suddenly, his friends weren't sad. Now, they were so, so happy. God had brought Jesus back to life so that he could live in God's wonderful place forever. And Jesus has sent everyone an invitation to come and live with him there too. He tells us, God says it is wonderful to live with him. Because of your sin, you can't come in. But I died on the cross to take your sin, so all of my friends can now come in. We can live with God forever, and there will be nothing bad and no one sad. We will see God and speak to God and just enjoy being with God just as he planned. It will be wonderful to live with him, and it's all because of Jesus. 
we will say every day, thank you, King Jesus. You are amazing. And you can start saying that today. It has a name. It has a name. In the creation story of Genesis in the Greek Old Testament, the exquisite garden in the middle of Eden, it has a name. That garden that is our true home, that sacred space, where there is beauty and goodness and truth, where we are meant to thrive in a relationship with the author of love himself. It has a name, that sacred space where everything is wonderful, where there is nothing bad ever, where there is nothing sad ever. And best of all, God is there. It has a name. That garden that was represented by the tabernacle, that garden that the temple stood for, it has a name. The garden that we cannot enter because we are lost in darkness. We are captive to unseen powers. We are burdened by guilt. It has a name. That garden where the guardians of the holy stand resolute blocking the entrance. Or rather, stood resolute. Just as they stood motionless on that curtain in the temple for years and years and years until... Until the darkest day in history. When the weight of humanity's sin descended upon the sinless one. And the author of life stopped breathing. Did you catch it? Did you hear it in the text? In that moment? In that moment. The curtain Tore, the keep out sign tore, and those guardians of the holy stepped aside from the entrance to the sacred space and they stepped back. In that moment, as Jesus was dying, as the king of all creation was dying, one of the revolutionaries beside him, being crucified alongside him, called him king. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' reply, Jesus said, today you will be with me in, you guys don't say it, paradise. You will be with me in paradise. And here Jesus uses a word from his Greek Bible. The same word for that garden in the center of Eden. The same word. Paradise. And do you know what this means, church? It means that this is not the end of the story. It can't be. Because in the garden, there is nothing bad ever. There is nothing sad ever. And the death of the author of life is both bad and sad. Or at least it would be if that were the end of the story. But it's not. It's not the end of the story. He is, after all, the author of life. And death cannot, death cannot stop the author of life might delay him for a couple days, but death cannot stop him, it cannot restrain him, it cannot keep him, and this is why, this is why the darkness 
of Friday's shadows, the tyranny of Saturday's silence were shattered when the light of Easter morning dawned on a vacant and a powerless tomb. The author of life has breath. The author of love has a heartbeat. And the king of creation is alive. And do you know what this means, church? If the curtain is torn and the king is alive, then it means that we can enter paradise. It means that we have access to paradise, but not just later. We have access to paradise now, today. We can live in wholeness and peace and joy, and we can live in a thriving relationship with the author of love himself. Today, if we turn our attention and our affection and our allegiance to him, because here's the thing, church, what's the best part about the garden? The best part about the garden is that God is there. And the best part about the risen Jesus is that he is here. And there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from his love. Because, are you ready, church? Because he is risen.
Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled up. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, they said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Like you believe it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And now go with the full assurance that the curtain is torn and the king is alive. And go with the confident proclamation that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Amen.